Those of you that are familiar with my channel know that I spent a lot of time talking about fountain pens with flexible nibs. What I've neglected to do, however, is explain exactly why line variation is so important to drawing. So, in this video, I plan to do just that. I'm going to discuss the ways artists employ thick and thin lines in their work, and give you some simple advice on how you can use a flex pen to create line variation to make your drawings more compelling. For those unfamiliar with line variation, it's simply the use of thick and thin lines when making art. This is a very old concept going back all the way to the earliest examples of art making, such as the Paleolithic cave paintings of Chauvet and Lascaux. Okay, let's get right to it and talk about the six ways artists use line variation to make their work better. The first reason to use line variation is to indicate distance. As a general rule, things that are closer to you should be drawn with a thicker line, and things that are further away with a thinner line. This rule is particularly important when indicating overlapping planes and shapes because it helps clarify what is happening in space. In a landscape, this kind of line work is crucial to achieving a strong sense of atmospheric perspective, in other words, a convincing sense of depth. Now, of course, many artists will utilize pens of different widths for this purpose, which is fine, and I do it too. In the second example, I'm doing the same thing, but with three Tweezbee Ecos of different widths, a fine, a medium, and a broad. This method is easier to control, but doesn't give you the subtle transitions and lines that a flex pen provides. Besides, with a flex pen, you can do everything with a single pen without having to carry a bunch of different pens around. Here's an excellent example of a landscape sketch by the Baroque painter Claude Lorraine, where you can see how the line variation is used to create a stronger sense of depth. This principle also extends to figure drawing, particularly where you have overlapping forms. I can use a thicker line to make one leg look closer, and then a lighter line to make the back leg look further away. This is just one way that an artist can clarify the space in their drawing, giving the drawing a stronger sense of three-dimensionality. Here's an excellent example by Peter Paul Rubens. Notice how he thins out the line on the back leg, and reinforces the line on the front leg, which gives the drawing much more vitality and depth. The second reason to vary your lines is to complement shading. If I have a sphere that is lit from the right side, I can use a thicker line to emphasize the fact that the left side of the form will be in shadow. As a rule, thicker lines should be placed where forms are in shadow, and thinner lines where the forms are in light. If I'm doing a drawing of a head in profile, where the light source is coming from the top left, I will thicken the lines everywhere there are shadows, such as the bottom edges of the nose, the lips, and the chin. This will give the drawing a sense of shading and form, even if I don't plan to shade my drawing. Here's an excellent example by Gricino, where he uses this principle. Here's my own example of how this simple rule is employed in drawing the figure. If the light source is coming from the right, I will generally put down a heavier line on the opposite side of the form. Keep in mind that this is not a dogma, and I never adhere to these rules religiously. Think of it as one extra tool in your visual toolbox that can give your drawing an extra boldness of line and contrast. Also, sometimes these rules will contradict each other, for example a back leg being more in shadow than the front leg. In such cases, you'll have to use your instinct and determine what looks best for your drawing. The third reason to use line variation is to emphasize differences in texture. This can be done in a number of different ways. Since thicker lines look harder and more solid, I can use a thinner line to show that something is soft, and a harder line to show that something is hard. Again, there's no strict rule here, but it's a great way to show distinctions in different surfaces such as skin, hair, and clothing. Here's a drawing by the German printmaker and painter Hans Baldung Grind. Note how he uses line thickness to make sensitive distinctions between different surfaces. When drawing the figure, you can make distinctions in line to indicate hard and soft surfaces, such as the round surfaces of muscles and the sharp bony surfaces of elbows, knees, and ankles. Using thicker lines in those places will give more contrast to your drawing and give them more anatomical structure. Again, there will be situations where the rules of line will contradict each other. In such cases, it's up to you to decide which rule of line takes precedence. With me, the rule of depth usually wins out, but not always. Here's a lovely example by Tiepolo, where, despite the looseness and spontaneity of the drawing, he manages to achieve a sense of solidity through his bold and selective line work. The fourth reason to vary your lines is to establish rhythm and create a sense of movement. In a figure drawing, I can alternate between thick and thin lines, or bounce the line weight from side to side, that is to say, if I have a heavy line on one side, place a thicker line either above or below it on the opposite side. Since the eyes are naturally attracted to thicker lines, it will cause the viewer's eye to speed up when looking at your work, which will give the impression that there's more movement in the drawing than there actually is. Here's an excellent example by Tiepolo, where through the use of a bouncing, heavily varied line, he brings a rhythmic, dynamic energy to a depiction of a static object. 
The fifth reason to vary your line quality is to draw attention to a part of your drawing in order to define the area of focus. In other words, to tell the viewer where they should be looking most. In this drawing by Raphael, you can see how the heavier lines towards the bottom of the child's feet draw the eye downwards. Why Raphael did this, I don't know, but perhaps he was trying to emphasize the weight and heaviness of the figure. In this drawing by Gorchino, the area of focus is created by the very heavy lines around the head. Also, note how masterful Gorchino is in using line variation to show slight distinctions in the body, the hair, the lion skin, and the club. And finally, the sixth reason to use line variation is that when you employ thick and thin lines, it makes your drawings look bolder, more spontaneous, more energetic, and expressive. This has to do with a universal principle in art making, which is this. Variety is not only the spice of life, it's also the spice of art. What does this mean? Well, imagine I'm doing a simple drawing of a still life. A drawing where all the shapes are the same will be less interesting than one where I include a variety of shapes. A still life where all the objects are the same size will be less interesting than one where I include a variety of sizes. A still life where all the lines are the same thickness will be less interesting than one where I include a variety of thick and thin lines. This principle of variety, again, applies to all the arts. For example, a piece of music that is played at the same volume will be less interesting than a piece of music that has a large range of dynamics. Or here's a more specific example. A dramatic speech with lots of dramatic changes in volume will be less interesting than one where I do not alter the pitch or pace of my voice and keep droning on and on and on and on like this. Here are two side-by-side -side drawings of the same subject. On the one on the left, I tried as much as I could to keep the line quality uniform. And the one on the right, I tried to employ a lot of line variation. I hope we can all agree that the drawing on the right is the stronger one. Not only does it have more, a more fully developed sense of depth, it's also much more energetic and expressive and hopefully better. Keep in mind that there are a great number of factors involved in drawing, with line variation being only one, and there are many examples, such as this wonderful Michelangelo drawing, where line variation is not really being used. Though line variation is not used, Michelangelo used many other tools to make the drawing great, such as his endless inventiveness, incredibly precise hatching, and profound understanding of form. Now that we understand the importance of line variation, let's talk about how to achieve it using a flexible fountain pen. The main difficulty is that this kind of pen can only create thick lines on the downstroke, like so, so that the tines of the nib are aligned with the direction of the stroke. You never want to flex your pen on a side stroke, or even a diagonal stroke like so. Now in calligraphy that's not an issue because calligraphic writing is designed so that the downstrokes are thicker. However in drawing we want to be able to control line thickness in absolutely every direction. So not only just on the downstroke but also on the diagonal stroke and also on the horizontal strokes going this way, this way, which requires you to rotate your pen so that the tines are always lined up in the direction of the stroke you're making. This limitation can be overcome with a little bit of practice, and here are some very simple exercises you can do to develop the ability to control your flex pen. I'm going to use one of my favorite modern flex pens for this exercise, the Pilot Custom 912 FA. However, if you don't have a fountain pen, you can do these exercises with a dip pen. The first exercise is to create a thick flex line in all directions. This will get you accustomed to flexing your pen and controlling the amount of pressure you put down. Some pens are easy to control, meaning that they make it easy to put down a line of consistent thickness, whereas some pens are quite soft, making controlling the line thickness more difficult. Notice that I'm always rotating the nib so that it is in alignment with the direction of the stroke. Drawing angles from vertical to parallel is simply a matter of rotating the pen slightly and shifting your elbow a little bit sometimes. Once you get past parallel and start drawing angles tilting the opposite direction, you'll find that you'll have to change the direction of your stroke, starting at the bottom and working your way up. However, once you start tilting back to vertical, you can return to making downstrokes. This transition from downstroke to upstroke is a little bit tricky, and one way to avoid it is to simply rotate your paper instead of your wrist. If the paper is small enough, that's easy. But you should also practice the upward stroke anyway, since there will be situations where you're not going to be able to comfortably rotate your paper. The next exercise is the same, but instead of keeping the stroke a consistent width, try making a transition from thick to thin or thin to thick. Again, this will give you a sense of how much pressure is needed to flex the pen and develop your ability to apply consistently increasing pressure. You can also start thin at the top, thicken the stroke in the middle, and thin it out at the end. Most strokes you make in drawing will tend to follow that pattern anyway, so that's definitely good practice. 
Next exercise I would do is to draw a bunch of cubes, with lines that thin out as the sides recede back in space. Again, another great way to develop dexterity when flexing your pen. By the way, drawing cubes in different rotations at different angles is a great exercise anyway, since it develops your ability to understand how this basic form rotates in space. Once we're comfortable dealing with straight lines, it's time to practice drawing S-curves. Again, unlike calligraphy with its thicker downstrokes, we need to develop the ability to flex our pens in every direction. So, as we draw the S-curves, you'll need to constantly rotate the pen to align with the direction of your stroke. I would do a few where you keep the lines consistently flexed, and then try your hand at a line that transitions from thick to thin, and vice versa. Drawing cylinders is also great practice, because the very front edge of the ellipse needs to be thicker since they're closer to the viewer, and the sides of the ellipses need to be thinner since they're further away. The last exercise I recommend you try is to draw blobs that are lit from different directions. The first blob is lit from the right, so I try to thicken my lines everywhere I think the blob will be in shadow. In the middle blob, the light source is coming from the top, and in the last blob, from the left. Once I'm done with this exercise, I would start working my way up to increasingly more complex objects, pillows, hats, stuffed animals, until I'm completely comfortable flexing my pen in every direction. Of course, do you really need to do these exercises? No, you don't. The best exercise is just to draw constantly while keeping the principles of line variation in mind. Everyone learns differently. Some people enjoy doing exercises and benefit from them, while for others, it feels like doing homework. If doing exercises is not your thing, no need to suffer. Draw as much as you can, and you'll achieve proficiency just the same. I hope you found my tutorial on how to use a flex pen to draw useful. The biggest piece of advice is to be patient. Flex pens are difficult to control, and getting comfortable with them takes long practice. If you're seeking immediate results, then you'll quickly get frustrated. Learn to enjoy the learning process, and to recognize that sometimes improvement comes so slowly that you don't even notice it. Keep all your drawings and occasionally look back. You might be surprised to find that the work you're doing now is much better than the work you did a year ago. Thanks for watching, and if you have any questions or comments, leave them below, and I'll be happy to respond.